I was a dick. Like, like that. That's how I was viewed. I wasn't. I wouldn't say I was a total bully, but I hung out with bullies and I didn't stop it. You know, I, I didn't stop it from happening. That was more in high school, and then in college, I felt like being in a fraternity. There was this figure that I had to put on, being an athlete. Like there was a figure, a persona that I had to put on and show. And obviously, being not being straight, being bi, did not fit that persona. That's Matt Kovacis. He went through school, college, and most of his 20s as a closeted bisexual, only coming out around a year ago. An athlete raised in a hyper-masculine and sometimes homophobic environment, Matt lived with deeply ingrained guilt and shame, which he projected onto others as a bully. For the longest time, he couldn't accept and love who he really was, so he did all he could to be someone else. Pushed to breaking point, Matt finally came out to his sisters and has worked hard in therapy to evolve into the much happier man he is now. Welcome to Young Blood, the award-winning volunteer podcast dedicated to young men's mental health. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is a platform for everyday men to share lived experience stories and show that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone. Suicide is the number one killer of young people and changing that starts with speaking up. So let's do it. The Young Blood Men's Mental Health Podcast is a volunteer community service and we rely on community support to bring this show to you. This episode is sponsored by Ski for Life, a charity committed to promoting well-being and suicide prevention. They've been running their annual ski relay on South Australia's Murray River for more than a decade, raising money to support community mental health initiatives. You can find out more about their cause at skiforlife.com.au. Trigger warning, if you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. All right, Matt, how old were you when you first started to question your sexuality? I would say it was probably in the, into the college years. And it, it was just, it was, it was something where I was like, why am I? why am I this, why, why am I, why do I have these feelings? You know, like you can't be this way. Like you're, you're obviously straight, you know, that's how you've been growing. It's, it, it's how I was conditioned. Uh, I was, you know, being anything other than straight was viewed as wrong, was viewed as something to be ashamed of something to be embarrassed about. So as I started to have these feelings of attraction towards uh, people other than women to towards men, Uh, that really started to uh, affect my mental health because it was just, I I was in denial. Um, I kept telling myself that that can't be the case. I looked into like those sort of replacement therapies where, or the conversion therapies where you can quote unquote, make yourself straight. I mean, I tried it all. So that I would say it started the self-discovery process really started uh, maybe late high school into college. What about those feelings of being attracted to men though? I would assume that that must have happened earlier, sort of around puberty and throughout your life, or was it so repressed that it didn't get to that? Yeah, no, that, that that's a great question. I, I think it was a little bit earlier than that. It, it, it looking back, maybe in earlier in high school, but to your point, I, I do think that I was grown up. I grew up in such a heterosexual environment that. I I think I subconsciously repressed a lot of feelings that I may have had because it it was viewed so wrongly. It, it was viewed as something that, you know, I, and again, this isn't, I, I want to make sure, very clear to my family, this isn't something they did. This is just the environment I grew up in. These are the friends I had. These are the types of the demographic I grew up in. But yeah, I, I think I probably subconsciously repressed a lot of feelings even before starting to kind of uh, have those feelings seep in, if you will. Yeah, that's interesting. So it wasn't a case of you go home from school and you clearly know that you're bisexual, you have these feelings under the surface and you're trying as hard as you can to hide it from everyone else. Like you really hadn't even registered that yourself for the longest time. I hadn't. I I had not registered it. I, I was always very insecure growing up. And I think that probably, again, subconsciously was there and played a role in in that insecurity. And then as I became more self-aware of who I might be, then I started to kind of battle those things, you know, internally, where I was telling myself like every night before my head would hit the pillow. And it's like, you know, it, it was just a, a place of, it just would keep coming up 
you know, like you may like also like men, you are attracted to men. Oh, that like, how could you do that? Why? Why would you be attracted to men? Like that, that can't be the case. And so, yeah, I think it got to a point it, early on, it was more, I think it subconsciously played a role in kind of my insecurities. And then it really ramped up once I started to kind of identify that these feelings aren't going away. And not only are they not going away, they're getting stronger. And that was really hard for me to to deal with because I wanted nothing more for that not to be the case. So as the feelings got stronger, um, it created a lot of uh, internal battles with myself that I then projected onto other people. So what attitude did people in your life have towards homosexuality that you internalized and being bisexual? Wow. Yeah, there's there's quite a bit there. I and, and I played into it to to be very clear. You know, if you think about what we, if in high school it was, wow, that kid is so gay or that's so gay of you or wow, what a faggot, what a queer. Th- those things were said nonstop, you know, growing up. And and so to me, and, and we bullied, I, I wouldn't say I bullied, but like I viewed the LBGTQ community as, as less than when I, when I was growing up um, because of how I was raised, you know, I had friends, parents of friends that were quite literally homophobic and, and weren't shy to talk about it. And again, my family was never that way, but when you grow up, especially as a kid, and you just want to fit in, especially with parents and, and whatnot, I became very conditioned to believe that being anything other than straight was was disgusting, quite frankly, was something you should be extremely ashamed of, something you should be com- extremely embarrassed about, and something that, frankly, like you should you shouldn't even come out. Like there there were times in my life where I thought to myself, up until three, four years ago, like you can just live like basically live in the closet your whole life. You know, it'll be okay. You know, your life's okay. You've got a lot going for you. And, but I couldn't fathom the idea of being myself in, in in showing who I was to the world. What was at the root of what made you think it was so wrong? That's, that's such a tough question because there were, there was so much there. I mean, I think when you see all your friends, growing up with girlfriends talking about what girls who they've slept with or first kiss this and that i was always kind of a late bloomer as it relates to having a first kiss with a girl having a girlfriend with a girl and so when you see these things and then you kind i was kind of bullied for for not having ever having a girlfriend like growing up and so that that then became as a place where i really wanted to fit in i really wanted to have a girlfriend and so if if i if it wasn't a girlfriend, well, it sure couldn't be a boyfriend. And so I think, I think it was partly obviously my environment, but partly society. I mean, I think even today, I think we've gotten, it's gotten a lot better, especially in my country, you know, the U S as it relates to acceptance of everyone, regardless of their sexuality. But I mean, it's still an issue in society today. So when you grow up and you see people shaming gay people shaming bisexual people shaming trans whoever it might be it just it it was never a thought of mine that being anything other than straight uh until i until i hit a breaking point which i'm sure we'll get into but but eventually i got to a point where i just i couldn't i couldn't deal it do it anymore you know i was in a relationship uh with with a girl for a long time four years moved in that kind of thing and again i was i got to a point where it was like I felt so trapped because I knew there was this part of me at this point, but I also knew that she wouldn't be okay with it. And so I got to a point where I was like, okay, well, like life's okay. You know, I'm content in this, I'm comfortable, but every day I feel like I'm not giving the world my a hundred percent. I feel like there's so much repressed emote. There's so many repressed emotions. There's so much built up energy that I just can't get out of myself because I've blocked my, my heart to really open up to anyone. And so, um, I got to a breaking point where, where, you know, I eventually broke up with her. That was step one. And then I spent another year or two, frankly, trying to, again, prove to myself that I wasn't who I really was. And eventually I, eventually I came out to my sisters and I, I had hit it so well. I've told the story before, but I had hit it so well from them. And I just texted them and I was bawling my eyes out as I texted them. 
and, and my sisters are my best friends uh, through and through. So I tell them everything, but I never, I didn't tell anyone this. And they thought I was joking when I told them that that's how well I hit it. And they're like, and, and so um, that just goes to show you, you know, the, the leap, the, the hoops I went through to avoid kind of showing who I was to the world. So just to backtrack, because I'm interested in your relationships with women, because you are attracted to girls as well. But in that last relationship you mentioned, you felt like you couldn't be the full version of yourself because you hadn't discovered who that was yet. And that wasn't going to gel with the box that you'd sort of fit yourself into in, in the life that you were leading. So that's what made you feel like you had to bust out of that and go and explore who that was. Because it wasn't the case of actually you're gay, you're not attracted to women. And so obviously you shouldn't be with a woman. It was, you are attracted to women as well, but there was this part of yourself that you needed to understand. Exactly right. I just knew there was more, more to me, more to my personality, more to my character that was not able to shine through because I was repressing part of who I was. So while I was still attracted to my ex-girlfriend, I didn't feel like I could truly be who I was. And that was really difficult for me. It was, I just felt like I was hiding something from her and from, from the world. And so when you have something like that built up, it just, I ended up projecting it onto to her, onto other people, onto friends, um, because I was so insecure. And again, through that, during that period, I'm still dealing with friends and in, in just the world, quite frankly, the the uh the shame around being L- lbgtq you know the sh- the the comments the faggot the the queer oh that's so gay like with the friend group because no one knew who i was and i started to slowly it started to slowly affect me more and more because and now today like i don't i don't really stand for it because that's who i i identify with that group now like i identify with that with this community But so I I don't really stand when people say that things like and again, like, frankly, I was numb um, to a lot of emotions when I was with my ex. I was numb uh, just in life more generally. And so I just there was something there was a gut feeling that told me, like, you you can do something special in this life, but you have to you're, you're being held back by yourself, quite frankly, and. I just knew that the, there was there were more emotions to be felt. Everything was okay. Everything I never got high. I never got low. I was just numb to everything, and I think a lot of it again stemmed from um, my sexuality and not just fully exploring who I was. What did projecting that guilt and shame onto other people look like? How did that come across? Yeah, people in college. If you knew me in college, I, I was a dick. Like. It, friends to friends to to people that weren't friends there was a say there are people that i think they called it like me in 2016 was like the biggest dick ever like that that's how i was viewed because even if i was your friend i would i would kind of i would put you down but i would say like oh but you know you're my you're my guy like you're my friend so like that's that's okay but i was so keen on putting others down to make me feel better about myself. Um, and so it just, it took form, you know, I was, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a total bully, but I hung out with bullies and I didn't stop it. You know, I, I didn't stop it from happening. That was more in high school. And then in college, I felt like being in a fraternity, there was this figure that I had to put on being an athlete. Like there was a figure, a persona that I had to put on and show and obviously being not being straight, being bi did not fit that persona. So I would try to be this macho man that acted like I liked fighting when in reality, I never liked, like I was, I've never been into fighting. It makes me uncomfortable, but here I was trying to act like this huge tough guy. And so I just projected it by just, I was, I was really rude to people. And again, I would put people down, not at the time, I didn't know this, but when I look back now, um, I was, I was putting people down to make myself feel better and it worked temporarily, but then, you know, I would wake up the next day with the same thoughts of like, Oh, well, 
you still like are attracted to men. You're, you're still like not where you want to be in life. You're still not feeling, you're still numb. So these were all just like temporary um, band-aids to, to the larger problem that I was like not willing to address. And would you use those homophobic slurs a lot in doing that? Absolutely. I, 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 as much as most other people. And because I, because I told myself, you're, you're not, you're not gay. You're not bi. That that's what I would tell myself. So to me, I, again, I was, it was, it was me trying to fit in, but at that point in my life, I I didn't even identify as something. It it was something that I would thought I would never do at that time. So I I would absolutely do it. I, I would absolutely, um, I would say it with friends. I would say it to um if, if i was in an argument with someone yeah it, it, i would use it just as much as anyone else and you had all these confusing feelings you weren't happy with yourself you felt really insecure and confused about what was going on and trying to match sort of these feelings that you had deep down with who you were on the service and like you just said you weren't where you wanted to be in life uh, you weren't being your authentic self. You were sort of hiding this thing, sort of didn't want to accept it. So was there self-hatred there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I hated who I was. Uh, I, I didn't like, you know, I would say I was confident. I've always worked out. Um, I've always exercised. I was confident. In, and I actually, I really started working out out of insecurity to build a little bit of confidence. But I did not like who I was. I didn't like where I was at in life. And I certainly did not like who I was uh, and who I was attracted to. I, it, it was, it was very difficult. You know, I was very unhappy. And again, it's, it's hard when you're in the moment, I, I didn't really recognize just how unhappy, unhappy I was, but I think what really, what really the light bulb that clicked for me was I, I've grown up in a great family. Um, you know, I've had my, childhood stuff like most people, but I grew up for in a loving family with in an upper middle class. So we had money. We got to go on trips. We got to go to Africa, like you name it. I've done, I, I've done it. I, I've probably been there. I've probably done the safari. And I say that because I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I have a great job. I have a great family. I've got what I think are good friends. And yet, why, why am I still so unhappy? And then that would lead to guilt because then I felt guilty. It was like, you've been given so much more than a lot of people, but you're still not happy. Like you should be like, why are you like that? And so that led to guilt. Um, and so that's kind of what, what really propelled me to ultimately come out is because I was like, there, there's nothing, there's no amount of money that could make me happy. Um, there's no amount of, of anything really, it, it, it really had to, so I was like, there's, I think the only thing that's going to help me out here is accepting who I was. Uh, and, and I'm very grateful for that because I probably would have chased those things if I didn't have them and, and told myself that that's why you're unhappy because you don't have that car because you can't go on that trip. And then it would have taken me probably a longer period of time to then get to those points and realize, oh shit, like you're still not happy. Mm. So I, I think that I think that's kind of what happened. So you've ended up developing some really good self awareness there after having no self awareness before. <laughs> I, I I was very not self aware. I, I was very insecure. I wouldn't take I couldn't take any criticism. Again, I would put people down. But if someone said anything to me back ever, I took it so personal. I would get so upset. Uh, I, I was very non self aware. Um, but through my journey with therapy and through my self-acceptance process, I think it's really flipped. And I'm, again, I'm really gra- I don't have any regrets. I'm very grateful for everything that's happened because I would not be sitting here with you and have this opportunity if not for that. How did it all mix with being an athlete? Were you a college athlete as well? So I played, I played basketball in high school. I played basketball recreationally in college. <laughs> yeah. And when we were that, it, it, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. But it was, it was a big school and we were actually very, very good. We, we won the camp championship a couple of times, but yeah, you can imagine, I mean, the, the quote unquote, the, the level of masculinity um, that comes with being an athlete. Like, I mean, you see how much, how difficult it is for, uh, professional athletes to come out and how big of a deal it is when they do, because it's, it's the, you know, think about being in a locker room. I mean, there's just so many factors at play and that it makes being 
being bi, being gay, being queer, if you're whatever it is in that in, in that arena, if you will, it makes it very difficult. And it, it certainly led to a lot of re- repressing of feelings, telling myself things that frankly weren't true. It's important to look after our mental health just like our physical health and AG1 is the perfect supplement to help take care of both. Just one daily scoop of AG1 covers all your nutritional bases with 75 vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, adaptogens, greens blend and whole food ingredients. You can count on this tasty mix to boost your energy, increase mental clarity, help you get better sleep, improve digestion and pep up your immune system. Plus, it's super simple to make part of your morning routine, all for the price of a coffee. You may know producing this podcast is all volunteer and I have to pay for studio time and editing to keep bringing you these episodes. Every dollar we make from this partnership will go towards helping to cover production costs, so it's an awesome way to support your health and contribute to young men's mental health all in one. If you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash youngblood. That's drinkag1.com slash youngblood. Check it out. So interesting in that sporting arena because some people would argue that in this day and age where we're a lot more progressive, I hear it thrown around and I'd probably perhaps even say it myself where I, where I say, oh, well, being gay is no big, big deal anymore or being, be, being bi is no big deal now. Like, who cares? It's fine. Everyone thinks it's fine now. So, like, why would you, why would you not come out or why, you know, which is a, probably a, a somewhat of a, a naive, naive way of looking at it because everyone has their own personal situation and there's religion involved and there's, there's cultural backgrounds involved. So it's different for everyone and I understand that. But we're not living in, the 19 the 1980s anymore the, the amount that we talk about it and how visible lgbtq is these days like it's a different world but especially when you look at sport so here in australia our main sport is a a, a game called afl australian rules so <laughs> for americans it kind of looks a bit like NFL, but no one's wearing any equipment and we kick it, but we also punch it and we try and kick it between some big sticks. Anytime Americans come and watch it, they're like, I don't know what this game is, but it's crazy and I love it. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain. But anyway, uh, yeah, so we've got rugby as well, but this, yeah, this isn't, and rugby obviously doesn't have equipment um, sort of like, like NFL. So that's probably more like gridiron, but this is like some crazy hybrid mix and Everyone's wearing short shorts. I don't know. It's hard to explain it without, without watching it. But in the AFL here, which is yeah our biggest sport in Australia, uh, there are no openly gay players out of the whole league where there's 16 teams or, or whatever it is. So you know statistically that that can't possibly be true. Uh, and we would say in this day and age, oh, well, you, if you come out as... Being being gay or or bi or whatever it is, everyone supports you, and if anything, it's it's good for you. It's good for your public profile. That that's sort of what it seems like, but that obviously isn't the case for everyone, especially in those sporting arenas. Yeah, because w- when you're actually when you're actually dealing with yourself, what people I think fail to realize is like, ev- imagine every day for a decade where you're telling yourself it is wrong to be this way and thinking constantly about what your friends are going to think, what, what every single person that you know, that you may have known that you knew in your pastime, your coworkers in your head thinking, what, what, what are they going to think? Or what's this person going to think? What's this person going to think? So on the surface, like I agree it, 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 and now after coming out, like, yeah, I, I, I was also lucky to have the most amazing support system in the world. And like, I think that made my, my journey a little bit easier than, than a lot of others. Uh, frankly, they, I, you listed some things that, you know, religion get involved and I, I've heard other stories where they don't get the support and I, I can't even imagine what that would have done to me. So I'm forever grateful for the support system I have, but yeah, what I think people don't realize is like, even, you know, and I, and I love my dad to death and I know he's listening to this and dad, I love you. But he, he told me the other day, we were talking about this somewhat recently. And he said, you know, like, why didn't you just like come out? Like, why didn't you just tell us we would have been support, like we would have been supportive. And it's like, I know that, but I wasn't comfortable doing it. And it had, it's at no fault to you. It's just 
with the with the environment that I grew up in and with my self talk, like this was a me problem and this was a me thing that I had to figure out on my own. And that's what I think a lot of people don't under, don't understand. And I don't blame them because they have just like I can't I can't relate to someone that's had suicidal ideations, right? I can try to understand and I will try to under, understand, but I can't relate because I haven't had those feelings. So I think people just need to understand that like it, it's much deeper than that. It goes it, it, again, like I I thought about it every single day for 10 years, you know, and, and when you do that and you, you tell yourself things, I mean, your brain um, can quite literally re- rewire itself. So all that negative self-talk, um, it, it really adds up and it makes what some it makes something that seems not so crazy to do on the surface absolutely unimaginable from my standpoint like like i said there were times where i thought i would just accept where i was at and basically live in the closet for the rest of my life it's such a good description and an interesting insight because i think from the outside looking in as a as a heterosexual person generally you think oh, if someone's not coming out as as gay or bi or, or whatever it may be, it's because they're so worried and afraid of what their family is going to think or uh, how that's going to be received, which is which is true partly in, in your case. But what you've said there, which is another huge part of it, is you'd gone on this massive journey battling yourself day in, day out for years and years and years just to get to the point where you could accept it, which is the most important thing. Like you could get to a point where you could say, this is who I really am and who I need to be and I'm willing to accept that and live that life. And for, it sounds like for the longest time, you just couldn't get to that point. And that's what stopped you. I, I couldn't get there. And the, the day I did, like I said, it was just over a text. You know, it, it wasn't even, I didn't even say it in person. Uh, and, and I was bawling my eyes out. And then I remember, fast forward just a little bit, my first therapy session, I was living with my my now co-host, my roommate um, of the podcast I have, but I was living with him. And I was so afraid that he might hear me during therapy because I was in a different room that I took the call, the first therapy session, it was over Zoom. I took it, I went to my sister's apartment to take it because they were the only people that knew. And I just, I, I was so scared that he might hear what I was talking about. And I remember the first time I, I told, and the only reason I was comfortable with therapy is because I knew legally that they couldn't say anything. So I was like, okay, I feel safe because they legally cannot tell anyone else. And the first time I, I remember saying the words, I, I just, I completely broke down, you know? And, and again, like there was, I really had to break myself down completely in therapy and through the self-acceptance process and self-discovery and self-healing um, to build back, to build up a new version of myself. And I think I've done that, but it, it, it was very hard work. So like when everyone, when anyone comes to me and like talks to me about therapy now, I'm like, yeah, it, it can be transformative. Absolutely. But you better be ready to put in the work you're going to, it's not going to happen the first session. It's not going to happen the fifth session. So yeah, it, it was, it took me a very long time to get to a place where I said, I am bisexual and it came with a lot of shame. Like I remember texting them like, I know this is not who you thought I was. I'm, I'm so ashamed of this. Um, but, but I'll tell you what, like I did come out to a couple of close friends after that. And what they told me, man was so powerful. Like when you hear the words, I, I will never forget it. One of my one of my best guy friends. This was a first guy I told. So this just it had a little bit more meaning to me. And 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 he responded and he said, "I respect you more, and I'm proud of you." And even now I get choked up just because when you hear that someone tells you they're proud of you for something that was the biggest place of shame and and just like guilt and you know all of that, um, it, it it transformed me. It was the most empowering thing I could could have ever heard. Um, so if anyone's out there, if you're working with someone through something like, and you are like, tell them you're proud of them, man. Cause that, that goes such a long way. That's beautiful, man. How else did people in your life receive that news? Like your sisters to start off with and then anyone else? 
Yeah, my sister's, you know, I actually had a list of my sister Alyssa on the, sh- the show, um, one of the first few episodes, and we talked about this and she she broke down when when we brought it up because she said she was just absolutely heartbroken uh, because she knew they knew how close I was to them and that I had t- I told them everything like we talked to each other about everything. And so the fact that I hadn't told them this, they just knew how much suffering I had endured. I would say everyone that I talked to was extremely supportive there was one there was one person in particular that i had actually been seeing and she she was she wasn't but you know like i I, it 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 didn't bother me at all quite honestly because i came out on the second episode of our show which was not planned at all but i wanted to do it selfishly for me because it was like this is who i am i don't necessarily lead with my sexuality like we don't like you don't lead and say hey i'm straight you know it's not like i lead with people hey i'm hey i'm bi but i wanted to get it out there just so I could live my life. And so when I did, I remember it came out on a Thursday, I would say that Friday was the best day of my life because the support that just rolled in from people I hadn't spoken to in years of like, it was just, it was so overwhelming. And it just, that that's when it really hit me that like, th- this is what I want to do with my life. I want to help people feel this way, um, whether it be with their sexuality, whether it be with any trauma they've faced, um, anything they're ashamed of in their life. Like there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, and my, you know, my mission is to make sure that people reach that light. And so it was, it was, it was a transformative experience, man. It was beautiful. One of my favorite quotes is by the Stoic Seneca. And he says, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. How true is that? <laughs> I, man, I, I I love Seneca. I love like Marcus Aurelius because I mean, we all get, I, I, looking back, I definitely had a lot of anxiety around it. You know, I, I thought so many times, what, what is this person going to think of me? Well, if I, if I come out, like, what is this person going to think, you know? And in reality, I got so much support. And, and to be honest, for the people that either don't accept me for who I am, like I, I that's fine. I would prefer them not in my life anyway. And that that's totally okay. I'm at peace with that because I've got people now that love me and support me for who I am. Like there's genuine connection there. And I had blocked off my heart from receiving genuine love, from giving genuine love to people for my whole life. And it's just such a more beautiful way of living uh, when you live a life of love and not through hate, because I was living a life of hate for a long time. And it sounds like you basically tortured yourself for a long, long time there, which is so common. We hear about it a lot on this podcast where people say all the things that they went through and it was all up here. It was all in the head for so long and there was no no sharing it. And being in your head is a dangerous place to be. And so many times when people, and I understand that it's not as easy as, oh, just do it. It should should be, you can just, you can bring that up. You can tell everyone it's, it's fine. Like, just get over it. I know that that's not easy for so many different reasons, but I can't tell you how many times when people tell their stories, they say that the worst part by far was just going over it and over it again in their head and not being able to share it with anyone. And that that was ultimately so much worse than when they finally, like you did, told the truth and and admitted things to yourself and others and set yourself free. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's why, you know, we're having this conversation because I've seen what it's like to struggle. I've seen what it's like to be at a very in a very dark place. Now I've also seen what it's like to and by no means am I perfect now. Like I, I try to be very clear on that. Like I still have bad days. But with that said, like I've got a very clear mind. I have a very clear purpose, a vision of where I want to take my life. So I've seen both ends of the spectrum. And I think we're all capable of because I and the only reason I say that we're all capable of this is because there were times in my life where I thought there was no way that I would ever be in the spot that I'm at, but we're all capable of working through whatever it is that, that we're struggling with. And again, for some, it's harder than others. We all have different experiences. We've all got a different support system, but we are all so much more strong than we give ourselves credit for. And, and, you know, I, I just really, I really want people to, to uh, give themselves some grace, give themselves some credit. You know, I don't, I don't, bl- like, I have no regrets. I don't, I think everything, I don't want to say happens for a reason, but I give myself grace for it took till I was 27 to come out because 
frankly, that that's just my journey. That that's what it took. It took, you know, it took a lot of brutal years, a lot of brutal times, a lot of dark times to get here, but we've all got our own journey. And, and, you know, that's kind of why I started the podcast because I was realizing I would tell people like, go to therapy. It was so great for me. It was so transformative. And they were kind of turned off to the idea, you know, and I was like, why? And I think to myself, you know, if someone told me two years ago to go to therapy, I would have had the same reaction. So what it taught me was people can only want, can only change themselves or they have to want to change themselves. But what you can do is act as a catalyst for change and act as a catalyst catalyst for people to get help. And by talk, like we're having this conversation by being open about our experiences, by being vulnerable, by sharing our stories um, that can inspire change. I've seen it firsthand. And so that that's kind of what, you know, I'm on a mission to do. That's it, brother. That's how it's done. Have you been able to to forgive yourself for being such a dick? (laughs) That's a great question. You know what? I really have. And, And if, and if I've hurt anyone, which I'm sure I have, um, and, and, you know, I had some, yeah, I have, I, I've forgiven myself because I was suffering myself and, and, you know, I still interact with people now that are dicks to me, but I, I fully realize that that's them projecting themselves onto me. You know, that's not, that's not a product of something I've done. So I give people, while I can't take, while I can't change what I, who I've been and what I've done in the past, I can be a better person going forward. And I give people that grace. Um, I give people you know, I I don't judge, right? Because everyone's, everyone's suffering in some way to some extent. And and if they're projecting onto me like that, that's okay. So I actually had someone, there was someone on the, there was someone that came on, uh, on Instagram and he reached out to, he was an old friend and we all kind of bullied this kid in high school, which I feel terrible about. And I've since forget, I've since apologized, but he reached out to my cousin, my best friend. And he's like, is Matt serious with all this like mental health stuff? Like, this is so unlike him. Like, what, what is this? <laughs> and so at that point, I took it upon myself to, I, I reached out to him and I said, hey man, like, I, I just, I know I've apologized before, but I wanted to sincerely and inge- like apologize for everything I've, like, anything I've done to hurt you. It was all, it was a me problem. I was projecting my insecurities onto you. Like, I hope you're well. And, and he was very understanding. And um, he said something beautiful, actually. He said, I think it's made me, a better person today. And, and I'm so glad he's been able to, to look at it from that, from that viewpoint. Yeah. Well, you've got to be able to forgive yourself and, and others. And I think the, the important thing is, is growing and learning and figuring it out and being able to reflect and admit you were wrong and then move forward and be a better person. You know, we're all human. We're all developing at different rates. I think the only real sin is staying stuck there and not facing up to those things you need to face up to and continuing to harm other people because of it. But uh, there's no shame in going through stuff and having to learn because we all do it uh, as long as we are able to move past it and end up turning things around and being positive, which you've done. That's very well said. Very well said. Like, like you, like I said, I, I can't change who I was in the past, but I, but I can, be the person I want to be going forward. And so I always try to treat people with respect. I always try to put a smile on someone's face because we're all, we're all one at the end of the day. Like if I can put a smile on someone's face or, or, you know, boost that person's mood, they go home to their wife or they go home to their husband or they go home to their friend and they're in a little bit better mood and maybe they would have acted out and now they're, they're a little bit happier and you know, they, they don't, or, you know, they say they give someone else a compliment. So I always try to just pay it forward. Again, we, we can't change. And I don't, we just encourage anyone to not beat themselves up for who they used to be because we all change as people and we're going to continue to change. Like me and you in five years are not going to be who we are today. And, and that's the beauty of life. Still going to have these tattoos though. <laughs> hey, I'm looking to get my first one, man. I might have to consult you. I'm going to get one soon. <laughs> so where did you come out as bi? I came out, I guess, publicly, you know, like to the, I came out to my sisters probably last, july so about a little over a year ago and i came out to a couple more people call it it took a while after that probably not till december january you know it took a while so it's still uh, being there still very fresh what's the uh transition process actually been like towards dating dudes because there's saying that you're bi but then there's actually starting to do that what like whether it was there a lot of anxiety around adjusting to actually going and starting to explore that yeah it, it's it's certainly still my biggest place of insecurity for sure and and with that said i've become a lot more comfortable with obviously with who i am i'm proud of who i am 
but it's still very uncomfortable. It's just a totally different arena. It's, it's, I, I didn't grow up with any bi friends, any gay friends. I didn't grow up with any family members. Like I, it was just a, an arena and environment that I had never had any, uh, I was never, I was just never exposed to it at all. So I think what's worked for me in my journey, my self healing journey is I, I do things on my time. So it's usually baby steps, especially with something like this. So for example, like I got on a dating app, um, where I put in as men as my preferences. And I've started just to kind of like slowly put myself, uh, immerse myself into that community a little bit more. Another example, I started doing comedy improv. Uh, so more of like a theater kind of background. So like, and I've made some amazing friends that, that I love to death through that. And that's just another opportunity for me to immerse myself. Like, I think we have a, a group of eight people. I think seven of us are, you know, LBGTQ, right? So that's the type of stuff I'm doing right now. You know, I haven't gone on a date with a guy yet. That is something I want to do. Um, I've got a lot of other things that I'm currently doing, obviously, as well with the podcast and mental health and public speaking and all that stuff as well. But it's it's for me, it's doing it at a pace that's comfortable for me because I don't want to go too quickly and cause a setback, if you will. Um, but I also realize that I don't want to kind of avoid this part just because it's uncomfortable because I know um, in order to become the best version of myself and fully discover the most authentic version of myself, it's something that uh, I want to do. So it's, it's a work in process. It's, it's an exciting, it's a, it's a little bit nerve wracking work in process, but it's a very exciting one as well. You said earlier that when you were in that previous relationship with your ex and you hadn't come forward with being bisexual or accepted that yourself yet, that you had this pretty overwhelming feeling that you weren't being all that you could be or that there was part of yourself that was untapped that you weren't uh, living into. How is, is that now? How do you feel? How do you describe the way that you feel now in that regard? Oh, that's such a beautiful question because it's been so transformative. I tell my sisters, my family, they, they basically call me the new Matt because they can't believe that, that who the, the person they're talking to. And for me, what it's felt like is I've had so much energy that has been spent, that was spent thinking about what other people would think of me, shaming myself, guilting myself, that it, you, putting other people down, envy of other people, jealousy of other people, all these feelings that are now opened up and I can just live the life, just live life really. For a long time, I felt like life was happening to me, whereas now I feel like I'm creating the life that I want. And I have the energy to do that. I have the clarity to do that. Um, I feel like I've got a purpose. I feel like I've got a vision of where I want to take my life. I feel like I found my purpose through all this pain, right, of trying to help other people with their mental health and, and help them become the best versions of themselves. So I, I wish I could put into words, but honestly, words don't do it justice of just like how much more free I feel. And I really don't care. Obviously, I, I say I don't care what other people think, which which I really don't. Obviously, there's still some insecurity of more of just, you know, like holding hands with a guy on the sidewalk. Right. Like that's still like that thought. When I see that, it still triggers me a little bit just because it's like, oh, wow, that that's going to be me at some point. And that's uncomfortable. So there's still it's still there. But, man, it's been it's been so transformative in terms of just the the empathy I have for people the compassion I have for people, the wanting, the, the genuine wanting to help people. And I don't mean to toot my own horn at all, but th these are just genuine thoughts and feelings that I now have. I've started gratitude journaling. I've started obviously the podcast. I started doing comedy improv. I mean, I've started doing all these things that in my wildest dreams would have never, would have never occurred. That's a, a glowing endorsement for coming out yeah. and also for I, I just being that, yeah, who you yeah. are. <laughs> Yeah, it's like if anyone's watching this and you're struggling with your sexuality or just becoming who you are uh, and embracing who you are, if there's things you don't like about yourself, I would just say it, it. life is so much more beautiful on the other side of that. And you will have so much more energy and so much more love to give. Like I just text people now and I'm like, hey, man, thinking about you or hey, thinking about you. Hope you're doing well. Like just wanted to let you know, like. Uh, I love you. I would have never done that before 
but but I there's there's just genuine love for people for myself now, right? I, you hear the cliche quote, "You can't love any, you can't love anyone until you love yourself." And I always I always thought about that. I'm like, maybe that's true. Maybe that's why. But 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 it's really true. It really rings true for me. Like I never was able to connect with people, but now it's just like you just have a, a new like it's so much love to give off to people, and it's just I want to share that with everyone. You know, every every day that I live. Yeah, a totally new lease on life, and. That's such a gift in itself that you might not even think of. But yeah, you had this block there before where because you weren't happy with yourself and you were suffering so much that the last thing on your mind was going to be, like you said there, being able to check in on people or encourage more love in your life. And that is arguably the best thing about life. So while you've got that that blockage and you're not getting to that point of accepting whatever that may be, you're potentially blocking yourself off from what what can be the best experiences that humans can have i think yeah no absolutely and i i still see it and it it pains me to see in people that are close to me today because i think when you get to the other when you get to that point where you've worked through or you've self-accepted who you are you can very clearly see when others haven't and that's very painful for me to see now because I know you can, I feel like you can see, I'm sure you can probably relate. You can see when people are suffering and you, and I think what I've realized is why, again, like I said earlier, you can't force people to change. Like I just try to be there for people. Now I try to support people like, Hey, I'm here for you. And I think that's all we can do to support our friends is to support our loved ones is just be there for them. Listen to them. Don't give unsolicited, unsolicited advice. Just listen. I think that's something that most people these days could benefit from is just letting people, letting people talk. I think Brene Brown says like, instead of trying to pick someone up out of a, you know, a deep hole that they've dug themselves into, go into that hole with them and feel it with, feel with them. Yeah. Um, We say here a lot, uh, we say sitting, sit in the mud. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's a skill, by the way, that's not something that you, you just, have for the most part, but that's a skill that I developed through my self healing journey because I had to go into that mud to actually get myself back up to where I'm at. And so I know what it's like to be there. And I know there was nothing more that I wanted when I was in there than for someone to climb in there with me, not to tell me that, Hey, you know, like you're struggling with your sexuality, but you've got a lot of money or, but you've got this nice car or, but you just got, you get to go on this vacation that's not what people want to hear. That's not what I wanted to hear. It's like this idea of like toxic positivity almost. Um, I think people just want to be heard and be seen and be understood. And that's what we need to do more of. I would totally agree. Good point. So what's the name of your podcast and why should people listen to it? First of all, Cal, I just want to say thank thank you so much for having me on here. I'm I'm, I'm so grateful. You were a, a awesome interviewer with beautiful questions. So thank you. Um, the, the podcast is called The Men in the Arena with Matt Kavachis and MD. You can find it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're looking for anything mental health related, we have conversations with all sorts of people, with cancer survivors, with nonprofit executives, with athletes, with influencers, coaches, um, you name it, we've probably had them on. And it's just a really good opportunity to hear people share their stories, hear people be vulnerable, hear myself be vulnerable, hear my co-host be vulnerable, um, and really realize that there's a lot of people that aren't okay in this world and that it's okay to not be okay sometimes. Um, And so if if you're at all interested, please go listen to us. I, I, I love, I love and I love you all dearly. I really do. And so, Cal, thank you so much for this opportunity. That's it for this episode. If you like what we're all about, support us by following Youngblood Men's Mental Health on Instagram and Youngblood Mental Health on TikTok. Every podcast episode is recorded in professional quality video and they're all up on our Youngblood Men's Mental Health YouTube channel. So please show some love and subscribe. A big thanks to our local business supporters, Pro Realty Property Consultants and Herd Financial. You can find everything there is to know about the podcast at youngbloodmensmentalhealth.com. And most importantly, please share these stories with anyone in your life who needs to know they're not alone. We're all in this together. Catch you next time.